Welcome everyone to Between Plays Stock Market Strategies. And once again, we have Tech with Sandeep. How you doing, man? Doing great. And yourself? I'm doing really, really good. Thank you for asking. You know, um, we pretty much nailed uh, something on our last interview. We were, you know, we were talking about uh, zero trust, you know, and that how it's going to play in the future and how important it's going to be. And just recently, like I'll, I'll end up putting everything up on the screen and stuff like that. I was noticing that IBM is now talking about zero trust. It's, it's becoming more like publicly known. So they put up a word that people would th be like, well, what's, what is zero trust? It sounds almost like you're saying there's zero trust in something, but in reality, it's a complete opposite. We have to have so much trust in something that there's like zero room um, for any doubt. And I think that's really cool that the zero trust that we were talking about is now like just being put up as a, you know, it's going to be a household thing, you know, zero trust. People are going to understand, oh, it's not zero trust. It's we have so much trust in it that there's zero room for doubt. That's pretty cool. We nailed uh, We nailed that one. And like I said, I'll put that up on here. Awesome. So, you know what? I just wanted to get something, uh, you know, let the people know something over here. Uh, so you're basically the vice president right now of uh, Decoding Tech, um, and I'll put up the website over here. It's a uh, www.decodingtech.zone, all right? So www.decodingtech.zone, right. and you're the vice president on here. Can, is, can you just like let us know a little bit what this is about? Sure. So um, it's a one-day conference in Brampton, Ontario, October 28th. Um, and the registration is currently open, so those who are interested can go to uh, decodingtech.zone and register. We encourage you to do so. Um, there's two chalk tracks. One is going to be on the metaverse, on the metaverse and how it's going to affect our lives and um, how it uh, will look in the future uh, with VR, AR, etc., and uh, and mixed reality. And then the other one is a 5G talk track as well, too, where I will also be speaking. Um, and as the vice president of helping putting all of this together. So that's really that's really what the event is. And that's really what we're um, what we're trying to promote, because as everyone understands, 5G and the metaverse are going to be pretty closely tied together. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, what? I'm going to put this all up here. So we're talking uh, to, um, you know, naturally it's tech with Sandeep. But he's also vice president here of decodingtech.zone. A uh, conference will be held on October the 28th in Brampton, Ontario. Registration is uh, currently, you can currently register for that. And as again, www.decodingtech.zone, which I'll put up. And it's a conference, it's a one-day conference on the metaverse and 5G. So naturally, anyone in investing, anyone that's even interested in technology and stuff like that, they should all, you should be registering and you should be watching this. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Well, There's we'll going to be definitely... a lot of insights for the future. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know what? And we're going to be talking and discussing more about this as the conference approaches. Yep. All right, great. Um, what I want to do today, though, um, Sandeep, is I want to get a little bit into, uh, you know, we're talking about 5G, but, you know, Global Star, Apple, uh, you know, Starlink, um, and, you know, basically... Qualcomm, I guess, because Qualcomm is, you know, is is a is a player in here with their uh, X sixty five right uh, chip. So it's mostly where are we going with all this? I know we've been reading some articles because uh, we were talking about all this stuff, and it seems to me that there's something brewing behind the scenes here with with everything. You you, you want to get into a little bit more into what you've been researching on this? Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> it's interesting because the, the, the recent announcement between T-Mobile and Starlink and the, the ability to get emergency services going using the, um, the Starlink uh, constellation, sa satellite constellation, right, in the low Earth orbit. So that's one way of doing it. What's interesting now is that Apple has put that Qualcomm X65 chip into the iPhone 14 which are set to start rolling out, which means that it supports um, the uh, N53 uh, satellite frequency, which is more commonly known as S-band. 
And so that is what Global Star uses in order to create, do the communications. So that means you will be able to have direct satellite communications to a handset. Um, right now, it's being uh, sold as an emergency services. So for things like 911, I guess, text messaging, things like that, um, that's what it would be used for. Yes. The interesting thing, sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, it's, it makes sense because uh, Global Star, uh, even before they went commercial, um, you know, they pre pretty much have a worldwide um, base, you know, because they, they were specialists in sat phone technology. And, uh, you know, whether you were in the highest mountains, you're on an oil rig, uh, you could have rented them out also just, you know, uh, in order for people to know where you were and stuff. And they were offering um, when they went to commercial, like the text messaging and the basics of the Internet. Sure. And then there it's not just it's not just um, voice and data, right? It's also IoT telemetry, uh, tracking of vehicles, yes. you know, forestry management, uh, things like that. So, you know, it, it, it's definitely like all satellite services when you're talking about remote areas or areas like mining or construction where you have to go out to a place and build a new city that or new uh, access points where there just isn't that kind of uh, connectivity. That's where a satellite service comes in handy. The interesting thing here with this deal with Apple and with um, Globestar, I think Globestar currently has 12 or, or 16 satellites currently up orbiting That's right now. The low Earth orbits, I believe. Yes, yes, correct, yes, okay. correct. Yes, the low Earth orbits. Um, um, but they travel a little bit higher uh, levels than, say, what Starlink does, so they need fewer of them. But Apple is... Um, is going to finance a $450 million for Globe Star on the basis of this deal to uh, acquire more and deploy more satellites so that they can expand the coverage in North America, make it deeper, and also expand co coverage globally, generally speaking. Because Apple, of course, if they're div putting this kind of technology into their phones, think about how many iPhones are there out there and how many iPhone 14s are there going to be out there. Now, this technology is not going to support backwards because you need the special chipsets and your iPhone 13 doesn't have it, whether it you, whether it's a Pro Max or a Pro or whatever. Yes. Uh, it's only going to be from 14s moving forward. And I suspect that they're going to include that chipset in all of their phones moving forward because they want to be able to help this emergency service work. Now, the interesting thing is because Globestar, ha Glo Globestar has their um, own network or Global Star, excuse me, has their own network of uh, constellation, satellite constellation, then that means that Apple is working directly with them to deliver the service. Now, the reason I, I point that out is because I want to talk about the converse. The way Starlink and T-Mobile have, have their arrangement is Starlink is going to be delivering the emergency services for the phones, but the phones are going to be connected to um, whatever the, uh, the backhaul network is that T-Mobile has, which means that it's going to be done um, using the phones and the handsets, and then the information will be trafficked over the uh, satellite constellation and then drop, drop back onto the T-Mobile network or into the emergency services network where they're connected to. Whereas the other way around is in terms of the connect satellite connectivity, it's going through um, the T-Mobile network right? Versus the way Apple's doing it, it's going direct to the handset. Going directly and to the so handset. It's directly to the handset, which means if it's going directly to the handset, then Apple in and of itself looks like, starts is starting to walk like and look like a service provider. Now, uh, they have been very, very clear in the announcements with Apple and Global Star that it's just for emergency services. There yeah. is a 5G chip in the phone, obviously, so that it can uh, attach itself to the 5G networks uh, in Canada and uh, the US, okay. whatever the provider is, but it, it's not going to be used for 5G. However, uh, the other thing to understand is that Apple being Apple, and of course, with the recent outages and things, you can't really rely on one service provider. So Elon Musk just retweeted, I think, on the um, 8th of September, that um, they had successful or they had um, positive talks with Apple about delivering a similar type of service because again um, the SpaceX team um, 
the Starlink Starlink team uh, believe that having access directly to the handset as opposed to going through the service provider to deliver the service is a much more efficient way. Okay, so all that is extremely interesting. I wanted to point out a few different things. You know, this seems to be um, a very big step also for Apple. Uh, you know, if you're looking at what, you know, we're paying attention to what they're doing here, utilizing Qualcomm, uh, the, the, the chips, um, bringing that in, uh, putting it in, having direct, you know, having a direct sort of link with GSAT and using it directly on your phone. It almost looks like they're, you know, Apple's becoming a, like a service provider. It's, it's, it's funny that you say that because that's exactly what it looks like. And at a certain point, you know, if you say it walks like a duck and smells like a duck, it is a duck. Now, the thing is, right now, it's just for delivering emergency services. And they're obviously looking at diverse service providers. However, um, the thing that's really interesting here is if Apple were to go and say, we'd like to be a 5G service provider attached to a mesh of um, satellite constellations to deliver that kind of a service, there's two things, right? They would they would have to figure out how they're going to position themselves with their telco partners, because every single uh, carrier in around the world subsidizes that Apple iPhone for the end consumer through some either monthly package or some hardware contract or whatever the case may be. Apple's moving a lot of phones through those wireless characters, so they have to be very very careful. If they wanted to be a five G provider on the ground also uh, as a service provider, including delivering that emergency service, they would likely have to cut deals with all of those networks wherever they are in order to do that. And I'm not sure that's part of Apple's business model because you know you don't want to cut off your nose to spite your face. So rather than do something like that, I see them more empowering the service providers to take advantage of the new handsets and the new phones. And then based on the back end deals that Apple cut, then um, I think they take a lot of pressure off the service providers. And remember that emergency service that T-Mobile is going to be delivering with Starlink and the uh, emergency service that uh, Apple is going to be delivering with the iPhone 14 and up with the global star are going to be delivered for free to the end customer. So if there's an outage or something like that, it's still going to work. You're not going to pay extra, at least for the time being, right? It's not a premium service. It's going to be delivered at their own cost. So this is about infrastructure expansion. This is about creating a backup networks. And it's about getting to a point where we can have a redundant networks like, like for like one for one. Yeah, this is exactly what we were talking about in the in the beginning shows because of the Rogers outages, redundancy, right? Being able to yeah. you know redundancy failover, but um, it's you know it seems like in time, it's like everything else, right? Everything starts small, right? I mean, what was the first video game ever created? Pong, was yeah. that you know like two little pieces of stick and then a ball bouncing back and forth, right? And look at where we at, we're at today, you know, it's, forget about it, we're metaverse you know it's just absolutely people roblox like it's just nuts so the thing is is although this is the beginning of adding in satellites i mean it, it's highly possible five years down the road i mean te technology is advancing so quickly that we can have full-blown internet coverage through um i mean the satellite system, like through global, global star eventually, like I, I'm just assuming here, but in general. So, so um, there are two, there are two types of services that, that Starlink's going to be offering, right? So it is offering. So number one, it's going to be the service that uh, is terrestrial internet, uh, high speed internet direct to your house. And then with T-Mobile, with the wireless carriers, it's going to be this emergency service that they're offering. And then I'm sure they're layering other services and things like that. So currently now you can get high speed internet with your satellite connections, right? That's that exists, right? You've got lots of uh, satellite companies out there that are delivering it. Yes. But I think the, 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 the challenge that you're going to find in some of those areas, like for instance, a, a, an organization like Starlink will experience uh, probably more outages than a, a, an organization like Global Star because of the bands that they're using. So Starlink, uh, while Global Star runs on S-band, 
which is less um, susceptible to atmospheric disturbances, like things like rain and such like that, or what's, what's commonly known as rain fade. Um, then you've got the bands that Starlink uses, which are KU, KA, and V-band to uh, send satellite signals down to where you are. And it was all satellite services. We we're talking line of sight here. So imagine satellites that are moving at, you know, 17,000 <laughs> kilometers an hour around the, around the world. And then the world is spinning and then you're moving in your car and you got to hit a cell phone or you got to hit somebody's house to deliver a uh, high-speed internet service. That's a difficult problem to solve. So it does work, but those three bands, the KU, KA, and V bands uh, that Starlink is using are susceptible to what's called rain fade. That means they get um, they get disrupted by rain. They get disrupted by trees and leaves blowing in the wind if they cover. They don't have direct line of sight. So your service is going to vary all over the place depending on what kind of access they've got to that um that satellite, oh, sorry, that receiver that you got, that dish you've got on your roof. Um, the other challenge too, as well, is um, that that will only affect the end user. So the end user endpoint is that the weather doesn't affect the satellite this constellation in and of itself. That's still functioning. It just can't reach its destination. So the end user suffers the outage. Um, and so, uh, Starlink has had outages. They've had short outages, nothing like the Rogers one, but they have had outages. Um, but they also uh, are, you know, according to them, they're working to resolve or not and or improve the service so that they can deal with those kind of things. But it's, you still suffer with this this rain fade problem, which basically diminishes the uh, microwave RF coming from the satellite to the receiver. Which Global Star already, because of the S band, is in a better position to deliver. Yes, they're in a better position to deliver, but then they have converse problems, right? Or converse challenges, I should say. Their satellites are bigger, they're more expensive, you know, they have larger arrays, whereas the Starlink ones are smaller, they're lower, easier to deploy, uh, but they have smaller arrays, which means you need more of them. Okay, but um, with Apple taking some kind of interest, I mean, in, you know, aiding to deploy, I think you were stating this uh we were talking about some stuff a little bit earlier. I mean, there's like, a, I, I, listen, you got to correct me if I'm wrong. Something about a 95% CapEx that they're investing into uh, Global Star. Yeah. So it's, a, it, it's, I think it's a debt facility that they're, they've put in place. So it's $450 million. Uh, Global Star does not, and that's for, strictly for the purposes of uh, purchasing uh, new satellites and deploying them. And, the reason Apple is doing that is because they're expecting to take up to 85% of Global Star's con satellite constellation capacity. Oh my God. So taking up about 85% of Global Star's capacity. Yeah. And so for them, it's beneficial to finance that 95% CapEx. So up to the tune of about $450 million um so that they can deploy those new satellites and expand the network because it's to apple's advantage to be able to do that and have a better reach then on top of that um the other thing that i was re researching is that um global star is not under any obligation to execute the entire uh facility uh before the end of the year so they can carry it into next year and do almost as an as needed apple's picked up a bunch of the uh the the um the fees and costs associated with putting the lending facility together. Now, you know, I'm not a stock market person. You are, uh, I'm the tech guy, but uh, if somebody's putting 95%, putting up 95% of the CapEx for new development, and they're going to take 85% of the network. I would hazard a guess that there is a possibility to convert some or all of that financing into warrants or stock or something like that further down the road, but that's what it smells like to me. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I was interested in global star, um, just because of their technology and thinking about the future 5g and all this kind of stuff. And then they went commercial and then you saw this uh, N53, uh, X65. Their history with Qualcomm goes way back. I mean, Qualcomm is um, one of the, it's the original company, one of the original companies that, you know, started uh, started out Global Star. And then they just went on to CDMA technology and GSM and 
then they're, you know, they, they stayed more land-based and building up towers and stuff like that. Cause I guess they saw it was, you know, probably the easier way and the best way to go about it. And now, you know, this history, long history with Qualcomm and global star seems to be there. And then naturally uh, Qualcomm has um, the patents on so much of this telecom stuff um, that no one else is allowed to use. So then you get companies like Apple in here now that are, you know, sort of invested with global star. It's almost like a, a triangle, you know, uh, these, these, these big players that are involved in this kind of technology. And um, listen, we know what Apple has done for the end user. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, with uh, the, um, you know, iTunes, iPhones, iPods before that, um, it, it, things are so much easier to use because of apps, applications. So we could see, uh, you know, touch screens. We could just see everything that they've done and that everybody else is trying, you know, to compete with, right? And it seems like they're going to this high oil level. Like I was looking at the stocks this morning and um, we have, uh, you know, at 164 is uh, where we have $1.64 is where uh, GSAT is at right now, Global Star, and they're in the green and the market is horrible. All right. The market's horrible and they're in the green. You got Apple, which is also on the rise at $153. Market's horrible, but they're rising. They're in the green. And then you have Qualcomm that's at $123. Market's horrible and they're rising. They're in the green. So definitely there's big money coming from somewhere. Retail investors are being margined out when we talk about the stock market, right? The retail investors are being mar margined out. They're broke. A tons of people are stuck holding the bag, even if they wanted to invest somewhere. In order for them to take the money out, they would probably have to, you know, take on huge losses to try to recoup some of the gains or hardly any of the gains. Like the decisions are, are, are very difficult right now to make until some of these companies come back and the um, market switches over, right? So we go into more of a, a, a bull market, right? And, and when you look at the fact that these three companies are all in the green, money is coming from somewhere. It, it you know, smells to me like institutions. It smells to me like uh, investing companies and all this kinds of stuff, right? And it's just bringing up excellent points about what you're saying. Something is going on behind the scenes. Apple's taking a, a clear interest in Global Star. Oh, well, that's that's very, very clear. Like Apple is definitely taking a clear interest in Global Star, and the fact that they're talking to um, Starlink as well uh, also makes it interesting. And they could just be building a redundancy into the um, into the emergency services that they want people to be able to connect to through the iPhones, or it could be something more, and it could be something associated with the 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 Timo uh, Starlink relationship. But that's undocumented. That's just speculation on my part. It's speculation, just like the the satellites that they plan on putting up um, with Global Star. Uh, we have no idea what these satellites are capable of. Mm -hmm. it, it, what might what technology might be inside there? might be groundbreaking technology in well, order to the thing. Yeah, go this ahead the thing if you, if you look at if you look at um what starlink is doing in the deal with timo right they've already said that's not that emergency services system is not launching until next year sometime right i can't remember if it's q2 or q3 but it's a ways away um the apple globestar service is launching by the end of this year wow so they're that far ahead of the game in terms of being able to work directly with the hardware. So That's of right. course, of course, you know, uh, a company like Starlink is going to want to be able to advance their their uh, the delivery of that service as quickly as possible. So of course they're speaking to Apple because Apple is well funded, of course, and also. Um, is the one that's driving it, all the innovation around that piece and uh, helping satellite organizations. Amazing. So I have another question over here, which I, I, I don't, I, you know, it, you're the tech guy. Let me know what you think about this. I, because I'm looking at it, I'm, I'm seeing that Starlink is going to be putting up 12,000 satellites, but Global Star is only putting up 24. I mean, is this like at a disadvantage uh, for Global Star, or is there just something I'm, I'm not reading into this? So, 
um, <clears throat> Starlink's putting up, uh, they've been approved to put up 12,000 satellites so far. Um, and I think they're somewhere floating around six or 7,000 there. So they're about 50% of the way there. They float in three different ranges. Uh, so you've got the lower ones, the middle ones, and the higher ones. Um, but they're all based on the same technology. The thing is, they're smaller satellites. They're easier to deploy. They have smaller antenna. So you need more of them. Because uh, in order for that to, to work, right? Um, think about it this way. You've got... Uh, what is no, normally known as a geostationary satellite. That's, you know, a proper satellite out there past the Clark Buck. And so those satellites are geostationary, but they're moving at exorbitant speeds just so that they can stay pointed in the same place, in the same direction, covering one point of the Earth. But remember, the Earth is turning, so the satellite is actually doing this at the same time. So it's traveling faster than the Earth to keep up to that one spot because it's further out than where the planet actually is. Whereas if you look at a satellite constellation, the I know the one, I don't know the speeds for the Global Star ones, but satellite constellation of that kind of size and girth that um, that Starlink has, it needs to be able to hop from one satellite to another to get you your signal. And it has to be able to do that relatively, relatively quickly. So the satellite constellation is traveling low Earth takes about 90 minutes to do a turn around the earth where your geostationary satellite takes about 24 hours to go around the planet and so global stars in the leo system in the same token is probably higher up in the atmosphere than um the starling ones which means they need less of them because they can cover a larger area but also because they're using the s-band technology the range is much larger they still have to, to still hop from satellite to satellite, but they don't have to worry so much about distance because of the, um, the S-band. They don't have to worry about rain fade because of um, uh, atmospheric, just, uh, uh, atmospheric uh, disruptions or distortions like rain and things like that. And um, that means that while their satellites are larger, cost more and are more difficult to deploy or more challenging to deploy, you don't need as many of them. Okay. So, you did, so, so that even though there's 24 versus the 12,000, just the technology, the altitude, and everything together, the 24 is giving out uh, pretty much the same amount of... Um, it's doing the same thing, basically. Uh, they've got a relatively large coverage map. If you go to their website, you can see the coverage map. They've okay. blanked out some of it due to the... Um... Global Star you're talking about? Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. Sir. Worldwide. Yeah. I'm, right. I think it's a quite impressive. I mean, and to think that that was, <clears throat> it's been like that for years. I, I just wanted to mention about, um, uh, you know, when I'm looking at the stocks, because, uh, you know, just today, like Qualcomm is up um, 0.92%. And, you know, if I go back, I mean, they were at, in the last five years, they were at all time high of $193. Uh, I mean, you know, when I'm looking at the stocks, I also see that previous that was at 51 in the last five years. So it's a little bit in between. We don't know where it's going to, you know, stable out in the end, but it seems like there's money going in in this bad market. So that's a good sign. Apple in the last five years ha hit a high of 182. You know, we were looking at a low in the last five years of like $35, $38. I mean, it's it's a little scary when you think about that, but Apple's technology is becoming so so huge, and then you know we have to look at the splits, right? We have to see, you know, I haven't taken a, a positive look here at the splits and stuff like that. It's very possible at one point they might split, and it becomes just more, you know, um, accessible, available to you know retail investors, and it might also be another good move for investing. And when you look at Global Star, I mean. Uh, I got into this company uh, when it was like in the 30 cents range uh, in 2020. And then they went commercial. I mean, it went to an all-time high of about $2.98. And today it's sitting at $1.60. So I'm thinking about there's a possibility that Global Star might be going back, you know, and this is my opinion, of course, where once we deploy these satellites, that it might just take off again. Um, I could see that happening. I mean, depending on what kind of announcements they make, they are a publicly traded company. They they live on announcements, but you have to have some substance behind them. And I think that um, this announcement with Apple uh, and the partnership with Apple, I think, is is massive. 
And yeah. it's also it's also game changing too because it shows the way that uh, the large tech companies are starting to think. And the large tech companies are not the same thing as the large telcos, right? The tier one telcos and the carriers. That's that's different. So even though they're all working together to deliver similar types of services, the large tech companies like Apple are the ones that are innovating on the technology side. The organizations like Qualcomm are the ones that are innovating on their Snapdragon processors. They've already released the specs on their X70. And then you've got organizations like um, Starlink, that which are trying to innovate as well too, or do things differently um, in terms of the satellite constellation deployment and how they're doing it and how they get access to customers. And then you have the telcos on the other side, the carriers who are effectively going to be the consumers of these services uh, right down to deliver to the end customers. So in effect, the telcos start becoming, you know, uh, customers or the, uh, the end customer for the global stars and starlings of the world, right? With Apple pushing all of that. That's just crazy. That's just crazy. No, definitely. There's a lot to look into, um, in, into this kind of stuff, this technology. Uh, and this is, I think this all comes back to, you know, um, like what you are the vice president of right now, right? When it comes to decoding tech, I mean, we're going to have this uh, big conversation on the metaverse. We're going to be having a big conversation on 5G. But this, without these kind of technologies, I mean, everything's irrelevant. And then, of course, the zero trust, which is something that we should always remember to look into. So I think that, you know, uh, definitely anyone that's invested in tech, in uh, understanding the 5G, the deployment of 5G, what it means in the future, uh, IoT, uh, metaverse. I mean, all of this comes into play. It's all it's all part of the same package, right? So I think that um, this decoding tech um, uh, conference, um, I think that people should definitely uh, be going and uh, registering for it and uh, becoming a part of it. And once again, Sandeep, thank you so much for being here on Between Play Stock Market Strategies. Uh, you've uh, basically enlightened us to you know, where we're going, the possibilities that are out there, uh, You know, talking about these three major players, Global Star, actually more than that, you're talking about Starlink, um, Qualcomm, Apple, the deals that are there. You know, we're looking at the possibilities you know, as publicly traded companies as well. And we're talking about technology. It's all interrelated, right? This is we're trying to predict the future, and uh, we're trying to see what is the possibilities and what's out there. So, thank you so much. And also, as being vice president and finding the time to come over here, vice president of decoding tech. Everybody that's out there, make sure that you take the time if you're looking at you know 5G metaverse or you're interested, you know you're in, involved, invested in these types of companies. Get on to www.decodingtech.zone, register, you know, you know, like we always say here, research, prepare, plan, execute. These kinds of conferences are very important to attend, listen to, and learn. So stay strong, everybody. Thank you once again, Sandeep, and on to the next show. You're very welcome. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Between Play Stock Market Strategies. Hit the like and the subscribe button. Head off into our description below if you'd like to know where all of our social media links are and also the podcast, whether it be Apple or Spotify. We will be doing interviews with CEOs, with analysts, and it's not only on the stock market itself, but also on cryptocurrencies and blockchains. We will have guest speakers. We will be doing panels. You will be able to enjoy a lot of different content. Have a great day and always remember, research, prepare, plan, execute. Stay strong.